Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the 2014 to 2016 series Gotham Academy. And the 2016 to 2017 series Gotham Academy Second Semester. That's right, this here's a twofer. You're welcome. Gotham Academy is a prestigious private boarding school on the outskirts of Gotham City where the who's who of Gotham society send their kids to get a world-class education, presumably in learning how to be a supervillain. I mean, this is Gotham after all, those supervillains gots to be coming from somewhere. The series was created by Becky Cloonan, who I last talked about on this channel for her amazing fantasy series By Chance or Providence, and by Brendan Fletcher, who I last talked about on the channel for his run on the new 52 Batgirl that I loved, but all of you seem to hate, which I'll try not to take it personally, jerks. The two would collaboratively create this comic that seems to primarily be about them totally nerding out over all the things they love, as we see an ensemble cast of teenagers solve mysteries in a creepy old school full of strange supernatural goings on, like this is a mad mashup of Scooby Doo without the mascot, Buffy the Vampire Slayer without the Whedon, and Harry Potter but without, you know the transphobia, and all done very clearly within the DC universe. And by that I mean that the comic is jam-packed full of references to DC history, particularly Batman history, getting nods to old forgotten Batman comics, silly and ridiculous supervillains from the old Adam West TV show, and even some great nods to Batman the Animated Series, which I particularly appreciate. Heck, even Gotham Academy itself is a reference, having first appeared in The Batman, as well as some other crappy animated series that I guess was also a thing, before making its comic book debut in this series named after it. So just what kind of haunted hijinks will this totally not the Scooby gang get up to? Let's find out and take this away. <laughs> The comic opens on a dark and stormy night. Okay, it's not actually night, but instead I guess first thing in the morning, since we'll actually learn in a minute that classes are about to start for the day, but still, it certainly opens giving that impression. And it's a perfect opening for the series, because that kind of on-the-nose humor will be exactly the kind of thing you could expect from this series going forward. We zoom into the school to find ourselves in the waiting room for the school's headmaster, Collingwood Hammer, which is a Gotham name if I ever heard one. Though all the students just call him Hammerhead, cause, you know, his name's Hammer and he's the headmaster. You get it. We begin by meeting our two most main of the main characters of this series, with our primary narrator being Olive Silverlock. Her name's clearly Silverlock because she has silver hair, so, you know, silver locks of hair. You get it. We also have the young Mia Mitsuguchi, though everybody calls her Maps because she really, really loves Maps. Again, you get it. This is Maps's first day at the academy and all of it's being assigned to her as sort of a big sister situation so that Maps has someone to show her around the school and help her adjust to life on campus. The two already know each other though because Maps is actually the younger sister of Olive's boyfriend, Kyle Mitsuguchi. Kyle's really good at tennis and you know because he's always wearing that stupid tennis hat. And I too mean always. As far as we the audience can tell, you must eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom with it on. But hey, given the naming scheme so far, we can probably thank our lucky stars that he's not named Racket or Tennis or Stupid Hat or something. Kyle is really more like Olive's ex-boyfriend now, though she hasn't actually told him that. She hasn't actually told anyone much of anything, because apparently something happened to Olive over the summer and no one is really sure what it was, not even Olive. Though it maybe involves some fire in the north hall of the school and a mysterious bat-shaped figure in something bad happening to her mom. The vague memory has made her scared of bats and bat-shaped things and resentful in general of Batman, who she blames for taking her mom away from her. Because all his mom is a woman named Sybil Silverlock, who is apparently also possibly a supervillain named Calamity, who burned down a bunch of buildings in Gotham until Batman stopped her and sent her to Arkham Asylum, home for the criminally insane. 
This has also, I guess, made Olive significantly more emo, as she spends a lot of time narrating in her diary about how dreary everything is. And we get a lot of people telling us that she's changed and that she's weird now. But since we literally never get a glimpse of her from before the summer, we're just going to have to take their words for it. One of the people telling us about how much Olive has changed is Pomeline Fritch, walking list of weird, angry one-liners that are frequently obscure references of their own. Like, smell ya later, ghost world. Who under the age of, like, 30 would even get that reference? Anyway, Fritch spends most of her time just seeming angry and grumpy, although she's super into the occult and also pretty into her boyfriend Heathcliff, who, other than having a seriously wacky hairdo that leads Pomeline to call him Suedehead, sharing a name with a cartoon cat, and being super into music, doesn't really have much to call a personality. But that's because he's only in, like, three issues before he randomly disappears to apparently become a road manager for the Black Canary Band in Brendan Fletcher's other series that would start running around this same time. The final member of our main cast is Colton Rivera, who's a bit of a grifter, always trying to sell illegal fireworks for no apparent reason and always wearing his sunglasses even at night, cause he's just so cool. I love how jazzed about literally everything Maps is. Even when the others are standing right there telling her that he's lying to her, she can't help but get excited about the very concept of night vision sunglasses. She's not just into Maps, it turns out, but instead just about anything under the sun. I mean, seriously, her reaction to encountering a grappling gun later in the comic is probably my favorite moment in the entire series. And she does it all while spouting, in true nerdy fashion, accurate Dungeons and Dragons lingo. Or serpent and spells, as they call it in the comic. We eventually come to learn that the real reason Colton is always wearing sunglasses is to hide his apparently constant black eyes that we can only assume, given what little he eventually explains about his home life, comes from his father being a serious asshole. It's further possible that Papa Rivera is attempting to beat the gay out of his son, as we do learn that Colton is drastically more into Kyle than Olive is though Kyle is completely oblivious to it. And while that's not how gay works, that's never really stopped assholes from being assholes, has it? There's a smattering of other characters who will have varying degrees of importance, like Maps' roommate Catherine and weird kid Eric who makes props for the theater department and has some kind of thing for Maps, but I don't have time to cover them all, even if I wish I did. Our first story, as Maps gets settled into spending time at GA, sees the kids investigating a mysterious ghost that has been seen around school grounds, and who might be the ghost of Millie Jane Cobblepot, ancestor of Oswald Cobblepot, aka the Penguin. Quack, quack. Olive and Pomeline, despite initially seeming to be at odds, are forced to work together on a project about Millie Jane for their Gotham history class. Whoa, what? Y you have an entire class covering the history of just the city? Is that like a big city thing? I've never even heard of that, but I would so take that class. I love history stuff. And this series' deep dive into Gotham history is definitely one of my favorite things about it. Their investigation into the ghost reveals that there never was one, just a life-size puppet made by Heathcliff and some other dude, as Heathbar just wanted to convince Palm that her attempts to summon Millie Jane's spirit had actually worked, seeing as Palm's super into the occult stuff. But the students also discover a ton of secret passages and stairways that lead them to a different mystery, where they discover a zombie! Oh, wait, no, it turns out to just be Killer Croc, who of course wants to tell them a story about the time that he threw a rock at Batman. It was a big rock. Turns out Croc was in Arkham with Olive's mom, Sybil, and she was nice to him and talked about her wonderful daughter, Olive, all the time. And this got Croc wanting to do his part to help protect Olive. So when he escaped from Arkham, he took to the tunnels connecting Arkham to Gotham Academy, the same tunnels the GA crew have found, and used those to keep an eye on Olive. But, of course, Batman shows up and spoils everybody's fun, and Croc is forced to run. Oh well. 
This does reveal to us, though, that Olive seems to have some mysterious fire powers, seeming to light this firework just by staring at it like she's Drew Barrymore or something. Feeling successful about what they've managed to uncover so far, the teens decide to make their association official and declare themselves to be Detective Club. Or, you know, DC for short. Wink, wink. We then get a couple of stories from Maps' perspective, particularly one where Damian Wayne, the current Robin and son of Batman, joins the school very, very briefly. As Maps gets stuck to him, the rest of the students become zombies, and we get a nod back to a very old issue of World's Greatest where Batman inherited a castle in Scotland. A secret dream for all of us, I'm sure. But especially Becky Cloonan, who seems to seriously love Scotland. At this time, we learn that Sybil passed away, although did she? It seems she's leaving clues around for Olive to find. She's maybe burning buildings down in downtown Gotham again, and we also possibly see her ghost in the school theater. Which leads to the detective club all joining in on the school production of the Scottish play, because again, Becky Cloonan. Which is one of my favorite parts of the whole series, as it introduces to us theater director Simon Trent. You may better know him as Adam West, or at least the Grey Ghost, from the episode of Batman the Animated Series where the actor in his cheesy superhero serials were shown to be a big inspiration to child Bruce Wayne. The kids here also start finding a bunch of clues in the form of clay. And seriously, this comic could be so a pup named Scooby-Doo at times that I half expect Colton to say, Jinkies, a clue, before Kyle shows up to blame Red Herring, who pops out of some unlikely place to explain that he of course had nothing to do with it. Haha, <laughs> yeah. It turns out this is because Maps' roommate, Catherine, is secretly a spawn of Clayface that has somehow gained her own sentience in a story that is too similar to the new Batman Adventures episode, Growing Pains, another favorite of mine. To be a coincidence. This leads to Clayface, who, as Bat fans know, was originally an actor named Basil Carlo, and Simon Trent having a literal acting battle in the middle of the second volume. Man, I really love this comic sometimes. Even better, with Catherine's secret out, she comes to join the comic as a regular, though sadly, in my opinion, not regular enough. And at one point, they even have her imitate Maps in another of my favorite moments. Ah, uh, Maps is great, you guys. But even as her circle of friends is growing, Olive's world is beginning to fall apart, as evidence seems to be growing that Calamity is still out there somewhere. Not only that, Olive soon learns that her entire family tree is filled with silverlocks that became crazy, murderous pyromaniacs. Feeling her own sanity slipping away, she seeks help from the school's counselor, but unfortunately that turns out to be none other than Hugo Strange. Who let that creep near children? Strange desired to learn the secret of Calamity, and so he has been pushing all his mind in a dangerous direction during their private counseling sessions, as well as apparently even dressing up as Calamity to convince Olive that she was insane. Again, who let that creep near children? The third volume of the series I'll barely touch on as it's almost entirely just a collection of stories from other creators that I don't even know if they're considered to be canon and most of them are honestly not particularly noteworthy. Though I will say that they're all linked together by this story where Robin shows up and steals Map's scrapbook collecting all these stories for some reason. I guess. There's also a story that features an ancient vampire and another student at the school who is apparently the father of future Batman, Terry McGinnis. A nice little tie-in for you Batman Beyond fans out there. The series then ends with no resolution. But that's okay, because the DC Rebirth happens and the series starts up again as Gotham Academy, second semester. Although it actually doesn't start in the second semester, but over the winter break between the two semesters, with Olive alone on campus. The rest of the kids having returned to their families. With only one of the teachers, the one that's inexplicably Scottish because of course, also staying there to help look after her. That is, until Olive gets a new roommate in Amy, who dresses like a punk rocker, so, you know, she's bad news. Gotham Academy, the after-school special. Another joke for you over 30-year-olds. You're welcome.
Amy's bad influence pushes Olive into throwing rocks through windows and breaking into off-limits buildings and assisting in stealing asthma medicine from fellow students, which, yeah, that one's actually kind of bad. It also drives a wedge between her and her friends, leading her to participate less in discovering the mysteries of the craziness going on at the school. Like how the English teacher is apparently using Mad Hatter technology to kidnap kids into her witch club, and then has them steal and burn books as some sort of revenge on the librarian, Mr. Scarlet, who is a reworking of the old 60s Batman TV show villain, Bookworm. Scarlet helps the kids put a stop to the book burning, but it seems he has a secret agenda of his own that has something to do with something called the Old Book of Gotham. This is a book that is hidden deep below the school grounds, inside some of those hidden passageways the kids have been finding everywhere, and it turns out the book was actually written by a great ancestor of Pomeline. The book is about a woman named Amity Arkham, who lived back in Scarlet Letter times, and was an intelligent, caring, and compassionate person that helped advance her society with science. So of course she was burned at the stake as a witch. Her best friend, Eleanor Fritch, took Amity's daughter and brought her to be raised by a family named Silverlock, meaning that Olive is actually originally descended from the Arkhams as in the Arkhams of Arkham Asylum. When she was burned as a witch, Amity cursed her attackers, and now every generation she apparently possesses one of her descendants and uses them to try and take revenge on the descendants of those who wronged her, a list including some familiar names like Dent, Cobblepot, and Wayne. And it seems Olive is already being pushed early into her turn to become Amity, spurred on by the appearance of an extra secret society at Gotham Academy, a modernized version of more old Batman villains, this time being the Terrible Trio. I'm sorry, but those big animal heads on those school uniforms just look hilarious to me. Especially Shark when we first meet her. Look out! It's a land shark! I'ma call you Jeff. This is most likely done as yet another Batman animated series reference, as opposed to just revamping previous comic characters. Seeing as there, the terrible trio was basically just three rich frat boy types, and the characters here, group leader Amanda Lidecker and Wendy Lawford and Rainer Hardwick, are all just slight variations of the names of the characters from that episode. Also, the group originally consisted of Fox, Shark, and Eagle, but Eagle here has been changed to what I'm presuming is Grackle. Seeing as as the Gotham Academy school mascot is apparently the Grackle. Yep, Gotham Grackles. Go Grackles! The trio knows some incantation that sends Olive into full possession mode, forcing her to become Amity slash Calamity. You get it. And she begins seeking her revenge on those who wronged her, starting with Harvey Dent, but when she sees Dent's already been burned, he leads her to Oswald Cobblepot aka the Penguin. In an attempt to save his own skin, Penguin reveals that Bruce Wayne has the truth to all of Amity's secrets hidden in his vault. Kyle, who is still in love with Olive despite her treating him like shit since the comic started, followed Olive to Penguin's hideout and though he gets burned, uh, literally this time, it breaks the spell on her and she brings him back to Gotham Academy. But now to bring an end to the mystery, the rest of the gang shows up to Wayne Manor to try to get the info from the vault. Only Two-Face is there for the same thing. This gives Maps an opportunity to once again team up with Damian Wayne as the two take out Two-Face and his gang. And, like, seriously, more Maps Damian team-ups is something I desperately need in my life. Like, seriously. It turns out everything leads back to Millie Jane Cobblepot, that ghost the group was looking for at the beginning, who supposedly went crazy and eventually killed herself, but Olive and Pomeline came to the conclusion that she just knew too much about her family's illegal activities and she was eventually killed because of it, a tragedy reflecting the earlier death of Amity Arkham. Her only real friend in life was a man named Absalon Lidecker, and he wanted revenge on Gotham in general and the Academy in particular. To do that, he groomed his family through the secret Terrible Trio Society to be able to resurrect the ghost of Amity Arkham and have it seek its revenge. So everything comes to a head in the North Hall of the school, the same place that, just before the comic started, Olive's mom Sybil had gone crazy in and was stopped by Batman. 
So we finally see that event unfold as all of the maps play through a grim reflection of the same scenario. Only with a happier ending this time as Pumlin and Colton manage to stop Amanda in their little cult and Maps manages to do what Batman couldn't and saves Olive from a grim fate. There's a ton that happened that I haven't even gone into like Tristan the Hunky Man Bat, Boy Bat, Bat Boy? Whatever. Or a story that seriously feels like it fell straight out of an Are You Afraid of the Dark episode about Headmaster Hammer as a young child at Gotham Academy when a circus came to town. In the same circus, populated by apparently the same people at all the same ages showing up at the current Gotham Academy. Spooky. But I can't spoil everything, if for no other reason than I don't want to talk for over an hour. And since we've reached the end of the main plot, I'd say it's time to burn this into the breakdown. What is there to criticize about this comic? The art is gorgeous, the characters are so much fun, and I love all the wacky hijinks, the Scooby-Doo endings, and the exploration of Gotham history. I guess you could argue that our main character, Olive, is pretty bland, and yeah, she is. And that might be why she seems to frequently be taking a backseat to everybody else as they take center stage for good chunks of the comic. The buildup is also pretty slow for how quickly the resolution comes at the end, but the series was clearly cut short. Also, some of the coloring for the series is clearly just patterns being pasted under already drawn lines, and when it comes to the school's tartan pattern, I find that a little annoying, because it's clearly just one pattern pasted with no concern for folds or ruffles in the clothing, and that feels a little lazy to me. But it only stands out because otherwise the art is absolutely fantastic. There's also pretty much the entirety of the third volume of the first series, which honestly I don't feel adds much to the series and could probably be completely skipped without much of a problem. But I can't hold that against the whole series, especially with how great it is at basically every other point. So I'm giving this series a recommendation level of... very high. If you love fun adventure stories about kids getting into spooky situations, you should definitely check out this comic. Also, seriously, someone make an animated show based on this series, stat. The collected editions get 1. Stupid Tennis Hat, 2. Plus 5 Night Vision Sunglasses, and 2. Grapple Guns of My Dreams. As always, that's moving from bad to good, though I definitely want to stress the lack of anything actually bad here. That breaks down like this. Volume 1 is six issues with a ton of bonus covers, sketches, character breakdowns, and even pages from the actual script. And Volume 2 from second semester, while only being five issues, contains a similar amount of bonus art, sketches, and page breakdowns. So they earn their high grade. Volume 2 of the first series and Volume 1 of second semester both are fairly standard size with only a couple of bonuses, and Volume 3, while being 7 issues plus an annual and a couple pages of bonus art, is still the weakest link in the whole series, so I'm counting a little harshly against it. Thank you everybody for watching and it feels so good to be back and making videos again. I hope I didn't lose anyone over the little short break when YouTube took my channel down. Sorry about any confusion, but it should all be worked out now I think. Since I didn't get to update for basically all of September, I'm gonna work really really hard to try to get some extra updates out this month. Thankfully, some of that work got done during the break in September. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe and comment and tell all your friends and share it with all your family and show it to everybody at school and whatever else you want to do. Help me get my numbers back up because they dropped a lot this past month. Other than that, keep a watchful eye out because you never know when I might post a bonus video. And I hope to see you then, right here in the Comic Cave.